going on, guys? It's Eric Turner from Cover One. I am joined by Nate Geary from WGR 550. How are you doing, Nate? I'm doing well. How about yourself, man? Good. It's nice to have a Sunday off to uh, not to be stressed out. I don't football. know about you. <laughs> you know? Yeah, it is nice watching meaningless football and not having to watch the Bills, that's for sure. And honestly, it didn't feel like a Sunday when I got up. You know, usually I have a routine or whatever. You know, it's, today was just like a free-for-all. <laughs> Yeah, it was weird waking up at nine o'clock, which to me is actually sleeping in. So yeah, it was. It, it's a nice little day off for me for sure. That's true. Yeah, from your point of view, with you know your job and all the all the things you handle, I mean, you actually get to sleep in. So I'm sure you enjoyed your day off so far. Uh, I am enjoying it. We'll see how my fantasy team plays out. Then it'll <laughs> then it'll be that'll be the real test of how much I'm going to enjoy my day off. Right now, um, we're halfway through the season. Uh, we do play Seattle tomorrow night on Monday night in prime time. Um, but I wanted to bring you on because I know you've watched all the film on Tyrod Taylor so far this year, and I'm sure from film from last year. And I wanted to, you know, evaluate him through eight games this year and compare it to his last games, um, you know, from 2015. And and I, I do think he's progressed a little bit, and we'll get into that, and we're going to break down some film here, and that's why I have you here. Um, but, I mean, so far, give me a general consensus on how you feel, Tyrod. Um, you know – where I am with Tyrod is I'm kind of in a, I'm still in a wait and see, which I think is unfortunate because after 22 games, I was expecting to be a little bit more either swayed one way or the other. Um, I guess it's not overly concerning that I haven't quite figured it out yet, but at the same time, um, you know, as we'll probably mention throughout our, our video here is that um, stats and my eyes tell me two completely different stories um and what you really ultimately want from especially an nfl quarterback um is just consistency from game to game from down to down um and that's just something we really haven't quite seen yet so that's something uh you know that we'll see and we'll really kind of break down um in a new in a, in a number of uh specific plays that we'll see especially fundamentally um and right. this isn't just you know our mechanics or um you know small stuff this is these are basic fundamentals that you want to see your starting high school quarterback uh do consistently and it's just you know aiming your aiming your front foot aiming your plant foot you know not over striding you know keeping your hips you know closed off not open to the line of scrimmage and just little things like that that you know like I said we'll have specific plays here right. um, that we'll really dive into no you make great points and you know I, I kind of want to give the the viewers and listeners a background I mean you played ball right that's right I played uh in high school I played 16 plus years um all of which i, I mean i played quarterback my whole life okay. um in college i played uh for my first two years um then ended up with a few more injuries a few more concussions than i really wanted to ended up just walking away just for the sake of you know Your being health. able to <laughs> do the things that i can do now yeah exactly. right. so yeah no just for that that sake alone so yeah i mean <clears throat> i definitely have um the experience at least watching and breaking down and, and knowing what i'm looking for um, and, and I think that's important for when you want to dissect a specific quarterback's game is you have to kind of know the trigger points and the things you want to look for specifically. So that's uh, something that I think will uh, be interesting to bring to the table at least. Right. Okay. So again, we're going to compare Tyrod Taylor's eight games this year versus his last eight games of 2015. And, you know, again, on the screen, I, I put up the stats um, of his first eight games from 2016 and, you look at him compared to last year, man. And, you know, again, we're going to do stats. We're going to break down the stats, look at the stats, maybe give some reasons on why, you know, he's gotten better or gotten worse. The stats don't tell the whole story, which is true. And but we're going to evaluate both sides. And definitely true, yeah. When you look at these stats, are, is there anything that, you know, jumps out to you? I highlighted a few things that jumped out to me. Um, maybe you can, you know, maybe expand on some of the stuff that I, I kind of put on the screen for the viewers and, and listeners. I think uh, the deep passing uh, this year and maybe his regression um, in the deep game. And, and let's be honest, let's, let's make sure we're completely honest when we talk about this, obviously um, not having Sammy Watkins is a huge deal. Right. Um, I mean, that's his best deep threat, potentially one of the best deep threats in the entire league. Um, but the regression there has definitely surprised me. Um, and it's really just been the accuracy on the deep ball that really has been the most shocking to me definitely. Um, and, and, and where he's placing balls and, and specifically on a few plays that I can, on his two interceptions, quite honestly, mm -hmm. um, he did something uncharacteristic of what he did last year. And that's putting the ball on the sidelines. You know, a couple of them were just, he left inside that were really vulnerable to a defensive back, especially good ones like Patrick Peterson. Right. Um, really just, I mean, that's what they live on. They live on a quarterback making a mistake, putting a ball 
inside opposed to that outside shoulder, which is one of the most important things for a good deep ball. But as you mentioned, um, to the yards per attempt, um, or, you know, and, and when you look at that first line there, um, you know, 6.41 compared to last year, 7.61, you're seeing that the new offense under Anthony Lynn has really focused on that short game um, right. and developing his ability. And, and what you see is a lot of, you know, double concepts. So double slants, double ends. And really what that does is it, it simplifies things for your quarterback to be able to say, Hey, you're reading one guy. If he takes the inside guy, you go outside then vice versa. And I think that's led to maybe a little bit more, but that's almost, I mean, that's a full yard less this year that you're seeing. Definitely. Yeah. Um, and that's, that's not what you wanted to see, especially this year. You wanted to see a, um, if anything, I know, I know that a lot of it has to do with him throwing deep and he's not doing that anymore. And you get a lot of those big deep balls of Sammy Watkins, obviously your yards per attempt is going to go up, but totally, um, you know, I, I think where I'm wanting to see the most is that short to intermediate passing game. And, it, and it's that deep in that's that dig route, that right. post route. We just haven't seen it all this year, the seam route to the tight end. And uh, those are the areas to me that where, where I think that number reflects most. No, I think you nailed it, man, because when you look at the stats comparing the two years, I mean, he has similar number of dropbacks, you know, similar number of attempts and completions for that matter. Um, I do see a little I see more throwaways this year, 14 throwaways yeah. for, for Tyrod Taylor this year compared to five in the last eight games of last year. So that to me, of course, we have had you know trouble protecting him and partly because of, of him you know, having trouble diagnosing defenses and whatnot. But. Um, I, I do think there are reasons behind him throwing it away and that's not necessarily a bad thing. Uh, you kind of have to evaluate it and play by a play basis, but yeah, you're right. The yards per attempt, you can attribute that to not having a deep threat and Sammy Watkins and whatnot, but because right. I mean, last year he had 10 touchdowns in the last eight games this year, he's got nine, two interceptions, you know, this year and as, as last year too, and taking the same number of sacks pretty much. Um, right. I mean, that's a glaring difference. And of course, you know, after the second game um, and, and when they fired Roman, the offense did shift. You're right. It did shift, um, especially the passing game. You know, they did commit to a more ball control type passing. And and I don't know about you, but to me, I, I find this offense very simplistic for an NFL quarterback. Yeah. And I think and, and I think we even talked about this one time and what it is, it's almost like it's their fake reads. They're not actual real progressions. What they are is they're. I guess a distraction for that safety. It's really just eye manipulation. It's actually not reading. It's we have a predetermined target, but right. I'm going to start left and make it seem as though I'm going through my progressions. Ultimately, I know that I'm either going to dump this off or it's going to my number one receiver. And if he's not open right away, I have to use my eye manipulation as much as I can to keep that last option open. And right. you know, like I said, we'll have you know examples of these, but. Um, that to me has been the most disappointing and, and right off the bat when Anthony Lynn took over and said he wanted to really focus on Tyrod utilizing matchups instead of actually reading plays uh -huh. that to me says a lot about where the confidence level of your offensive coordinator has in your starting quarterback if he wants you to focus and that talk about simplistic I mean that really simplifies things when yeah. you're saying all right I'm pre-snap I'm looking for a mismatch and then I am not looking elsewhere um, right. those are things that you need your quarterback to be able to dissect because the matchup isn't always going to dictate where the ball goes. I mean, and that's, you know, football one one And, and when he said that, you know, it's nice, it's fine and dandy when, you know, you find the matchup, that's fine. But most of the time that's if they're playing man coverage, that's the way I look at it. And you see, right. we're going to show on film, I, you know, it's my opinion that Tyrod is a good quarterback when he knows it's man coverage, but if they're playing mm -hmm. some kind of zone or mixed coverage, he, he struggles and that's when he does hold the ball along and, and he gets into trouble. So um, I think too, uh, a lot of his success on, in man to man coverage has come from his receivers being faster than the guy that's on the other side of the ball. Physical. Yes. And, right. And what you haven't seen, I mean, I think two weeks ago when he threw a, a back shoulder fade to Justin Hunter in the end zone, I think that was the first time in 22 games I've seen him execute a back shoulder fade right. and he didn't do well. It was, it was a poorly thrown ball yeah. and you just wonder like in man to man, that's like, that's a bread and butter play for teams right. is that back shoulder throw is you're putting that corner in such a predicament in a man to man coverage, especially against with an athletic receiver or a tall receiver, a back shoulder throw should be something you practice. I mean, when, when, when I was in college, I mean, that's like you go out there to, to warm up. Those are the first throws you make when you're warming up is the back shoulder throw to warm things up. So it's like, where is this in your offense? You know, right. these, again, these are small critiques and, and maybe again, maybe I'm pulling hairs, but, 
Um, you know, these are just things that, you know, when you look at it, you, you go through it, it's something you just, you're left wanting more. Right. No, totally. And, um, we're going to evaluate him on many different levels. And one thing that I did notice, um, you know, this year versus last year, and you can see it on the screen, the accuracy percentage, it looked like there was a slight jump, but I mean, like you, you touched upon, you can attribute that to many things. One of them being the, the type of offense that we're now running as far as the passing game goes, but as good as 70% sounds in accuracy percentage, that's one of the worst in the league. Right. And it's one of those, again, it's the adjusted completion percentage. So this isn't, you know, these sort of stats are, are a little bit more in depth than you're going to get with just right. the basic box score. You know, you're not going to get that type of stat. And, you know, th- these sort of things go into being able to lead your team to on a comeback or being able to sustain drives and not just go three and out. And I think what this stat tells you too is maybe his unwillingness to pass the ball on first down. They're really passing the ball in passing situations. And and I think that hurts their ability to pass. Definitely. And, you know, this year he's got a 70.7 accuracy percentage. And for people that don't know, when Pro Football Focus puts out these analytics, adjusted completion percentage does not take into account, you know, drops. So if a receiver drops, they take that all away. So, you know, that's one of the, that's one of the uh, statistics that a lot of people say, when you look at the completion percentage for the year, Tyrod has a 58.9 completion percentage. So people are going to say, oh, well, he's got a lot of drops. Yeah, he does. But guess what? Adjusted completion percentage, this accuracy percentage of 70.7 takes that into account and doesn't penalize him for that. Doesn't right. penalize him for throwaways. Doesn't penalize him for hit as he was thrown. Uh, he's throwing, you know, and he was hit. So I, you get, this is a more accurate reflection of how accurate he is as a passer. And a lot of people don't realize that he's still – for all the good things he brings, he's still, he's not an accurate passer. And to me, that's the most important aspect of a quarterback in the NFL accuracy. I think these stats you could consider maybe more organic passing stats. You know, these are, um, these are as true as they get. Um, and it gives people, I think a little bit better idea of what you have opposed. You're right. Because just normal box score stats are going to give you that completion percentage, but it doesn't take into account those drops. It doesn't take into account those throwaways. And, you know, those are things that you really want to take into account when you're evaluating a quarterback for sure. Totally. So, um, again, we, we went over, you know, the yards per attempt going down and why we've covered, you know, you, you nailed the deep pass percentage and why, you know, why that's um, gone down, but his accuracy has gone up. So uh, another thing that I wanted to touch upon was, I mean, Greg Roman, the first two games, Greg Roman, um, when you watch the film again, because I went back and watched every throw prior to, you know, going live with you and, you know, there was a report, I can't remember where it came from, but there was a report that Greg Roman, um, you know, he's that the genius. He was always in the room, in the, in the meeting rooms, drawing up plays and everything like that, and not really, um, you know, teaching Tyrod to play quarterback. And I do remember uh, Trent Dilfer in the offseason had mentioned something about, you know, the drop back game and, you know, that, that Greg Roman needs to develop that and he doesn't like the, the drop back game in Buffalo. Um, do you remember hearing about that? And if so, you know, what kind of, uh, you know, what do you have to say about that? Cause I, I saw it on film after watching it again. I'm right. like, man, he really didn't have reads or progressions. Well, the thing that I noticed most about Greg Roman and going and what I noticed about it was when I went back and like looked at film of him playing or it, when he was in San Francisco um, was really, he predicated his all off his whole offense on basically pre-snap movement and being able to like create those matchups. And as we talked about under Anthony Lynn, like Tyrod's matchups, quote unquote, uh, are a big part of what he wants him to do. But at the same time, you get those matchups, you get those favorable matchups by having pre-snap motions and having people move from side to side. And you're right. That's how he disguised Kyle Kaepernick's shortcomings as a quarterback. He disguised them by creating matchups. So if you don't think you have a quarterback, you go through progressions and go through his one, two, three, and then either run or jump off, then you need to create a matchup. And they had a lot of players on that San Francisco team, you know, Delaney Walker, people who are mismatched nightmares, guys that right. don't match up well against defending, you know, especially linebackers or, or smaller side safety. So yeah, you're right. And the drop back game has really, I think, since about, I don't know, since we've had a, a capable, I think, thrower um, has really been their Achilles heel. And, and it's something I've noticed. I mean, this team is basically on average this season out of shotgun 78% of the time. Right. Um, 
is Tyrod Taylor a shotgun quarterback? His mechanics suggest no. His mechanics right. suggest that you can tell because uh, in a three or five step progression out of center, those concepts are come up. You know, a three step drop is was created with the idea that you're coming under center. Mm-hmm. So one, two, three, throw out of shotgun, that's totally flipped on its head. It's really a one step and you have to get the ball quickly, find the laces, diagnose where you're going with the ball. And that's what I think has been his biggest shortcoming is he can't make those quick plays out of shotgun. He doesn't have the mechanics for it. Right. And you know, you, you hit it home because um, kind of explain to the viewers, it, it, like when you out, you're out of shotgun, they usually do that for, especially inexperienced or younger quarterbacks um, to what? So they can see the defense, you know, they're not turning their back on play actions, you know, and they're not worried right. about the little things of the drops and whatnot. Um, so it does, I mean, the fact that we've been in shotgun that much, it is alarming. And I totally agree with you um, because especially when you look at the type of quarterback that Taylor is, he's not a pure drop back passer and his fundamentals are shaky at best. So by putting him in a shotgun and have him, you know, not have him go through the normal cycle of dropping back or whatnot, or, or, or having the offense timed up, you know, the receiver's routes are matched up with the, the, the drop. Um, it, it, it allows him to just stand back there, and then he, he kind of gets flustered. So I, I totally agree. Being in a shotgun too much is, in my opinion, I think we've, we've done it way too much, and we need to get back to putting him under center. I mean, it's, it's not something that we've done, you know, under this regime. That's what's scary. Yeah, and what, what you notice, too, is – a lot of his ill-advised throws on those short outs, those five to 10 yard outs, you see a lot, like you just see it under thrown a lot. And it's because he's getting the ball and his hips are open. So he's basically open to the line of scrimmage opposed to being close to it. And when you're coming out of center and you're taking a traditional three-step drop, you're forced to be close to that route. Right. So you're going to make more accurate throws because, and, and you'll see it too, is his fundamentals from under center are better. He, he takes a nice five-step drop. The guy has really good Smooth. fundamentals from under center. And he ran mostly out of under center in college. He ran right. a pro-style pro style offense in Virginia Tech. And now it's almost like they've created a pistol-style offense. It's essentially that, that San Francisco offense under Kaepernick. But he just doesn't, to me, seem like the kind of guy you wanted to stick back there. And Because, and, and, like you said, out of shotgun, you want a guy who can – get in a, a heads up or, or, you know, a play up on that defense to be right. able to read, but he's not reading. So again, what's the point then of having him back there, having the quote unquote advantage of reading a defense sooner right. to me, there's not an advantage if you don't have a quarterback that's reading. No, you're right. And again, yeah, you put a guy in shotgun. That's why shotgun was created. So that, that quarterback, you know, had that extra second, the extra time to, to evaluate the defense and the front and the coverage. So when you have a guy like this, you know, second year as second year starting, um, that can't do that. I mean, it, it doesn't make sense for me to keep him in a shotgun as much as we have. Right. It. So it brings me to the point, um, you know, I'm trying to figure out like his mechanics are bad. It doesn't look like they're progressing that much. Does he have the proper coaching in place? Cause I know mm-hmm. like I said in the off season, Dilfer had mentioned something that, uh, in the, in the line, I think it was during Super Bowl week. He said that, you know, about the drop back game and, and, and the feet and the eyes of the quarterback and how they're not teaching him. And that was like, you know, it, it, it raised it up. It raised my eyebrows because I'm like, man, what what am I missing? So I went back and looked, and you know, he's right. And um, so I mean, if it leaves a quarterback coach, you know, obviously Roman's gone. Lynn is a running back coach. I mean, what kind of you know tutelage or mentorship do they really have? You know, working with Tyrod Taylor. Yeah, I mean, it's a great question. I mean, you talk about you know Anthony Lynn being a running backs coach, and David Lee to me is a running back uh, is a running backs coach. Right. Um, I mean, as you can see here over the course of his career, he's been the quarterback's coach really kind of over the course of his career. But what you don't see here are some of his college days, um, you know, and we talked about this right before we went on is, you know, David Lee's really best known for creating the wildcat offense. And this offense essentially disguises bad quarterback play. Um, right. And you looked at, you know, he had three tremendous running backs. He had Peyton Hillis, uh, Darren McFadden and Felix Jones at, at uh, Arkansas. Right. Obviously, I don't even know who cares who his quarterback is. You have those three guys. You want to get them involved in the offense as much as possible. Then he moves on to Miami as their offensive coordinator, or I'm sorry, as their quarterback's coach. Um, that year they had um, Chad Pennington. And, right. you know, again, as we mentioned, he was already at that point at least an established mediocre starter in the league. There was no developing of, of Chad Pennington's game from there. So then you start to really wonder, well, 
who has he really developed as a coach? Exactly. Um, and, and then you really wonder, well, I guess no one, because um, when you're look through the jets, when he was with the jets um, and when he was with the bills previously, you know, you'd start to look through and you're like, man, I mean, Trent Edwards. Okay. I mean, maybe he was nah, you know, and then you right. just start going through these <laughs> quarterbacks. And you're really like, well, what has he done as an, as a, as a quarterback's coach in this league? And then you kind of get back to the same spot that you're at now. And you're like, well, really? No. And uh, right. I mean, that's, that's concerning when you're having a quarterback, I think right now trying to develop as a starter, you don't have the, I think the people in place to fully develop that drop back game in my mind. Yeah, no, I, I agree. And, and, and that's what worries me because, you know, we have this, you know, big contract on the table for him basically. Right. And, you know, you got to evaluate this guy. Yes, he's down weapons and whatnot. But, I mean, when it comes down to it, you may have to pay this guy decent money. And, and he, I put his contract, you know, up on the screen right now. But, um, you know, I wonder, does the lack of having a, a guy that can help develop the quarterback, because I don't think David Lee has done really anything to help Tyrod. I think what happens, especially when Tyrod's under pressure, is he resorts to his athleticism, which – Yep. I, I get is a good thing to have when, you know, have an inexperienced quarterback like him, even though he's been in the league for many years, but um, cause he can always resort to that. If the line, you know, break, you know, blocking breaks down or whatnot, but in the end we need him to pass and stand in there and make these passes and this big contract right. sitting on the table. So, I mean, I know it's kind of like a pickup option, you know, next year. Do you think that maybe this contract similar? Cause I have the same theory about Gilmore. I think like that, that contract, being on the table or, you know, is actually affecting Tyrod's play. Yeah. Do you agree with that? I mean, it, it just, it worries me. I don't want to say it's affected his play, but I think he realizes now he has more to live up to ultimately. Right. And um, for the team, what I, and this is what I've really been saying since they signed him is they've kind of unfortunately put a timeline on his development. They yeah. said, you basically have until the end of this season. So essentially eight more games to find out if you're a franchise quarterback. And, I, and not only is I think that's unfair to him, but it's unfair to the franchise, you know, right. and they put themselves in a difficult position now where they're saying, okay, well, you've got eight more games, figure it out. And I don't know that you're going to have an answer one way or another. I don't think so either. Just eight more games. I mean, what he's shown through 22, you're like, yes, maybe there is something there, but at the same time, you're like, I still want more. So what right. more could he potentially prove to you in eight games? I don't know. I, and especially without Sammy Watkins, um, who knows? But I mean, maybe if he's got his full complement of weapons and he got seven games after the bye week, maybe then we can start looking at him and, and expecting more from him. But right now, you know, we're just everyone's in a tough spot. Right. And 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 I say maybe it affects his play by by because, you know, we're going to look at some film on some throws in tight windows that he hasn't made, you know, made. So he it almost feels I don't feel like he's playing, you know cautiously but I mean that's kind of the way he's he's played you know prior to this year so it's nothing new I get that but the progress we need to see may be getting hampered because of that contract and he knows if he plays it safe like he's playing right now and not turning the ball over that's his saving grace I mean in this Mm -hmm. style offense that'll save him that'll get him to the next tier of that contract yeah so um it's not what you want to see though right I mean it's it's not what you want to see yeah definitely not but in your opinion as a passer, because we know what he brings with his legs and whatnot. We're going to show some video and, and give him credit for that because he's a heck of an athlete. But can he win a game single-handedly? Can he bring a team back, Ooh. Nate? Because I know you Ooh. did an article um, comparing Russell Wilson, you know, who we played tomorrow night, um, comparing you know Russell to Tyrod Taylor. And there are some glimmers of hope when you look at the statistics and you look at some right. of the film because – I mean, they're very similar players, and they bring a lot to the table that are, you know, it's very, that's likable. I mean, it really is. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, and I mean, we I just watched it right before we got on here, and, and Matt Stafford brings back the Detroit Lions again. It's the 25th career fourth quarter or wow. later comeback that Stafford's had over the course of his career, and that's staggering for anyone. Right. And then you look at and, – and what I don't want to do is, is compare – Basically, the because obviously with Wilson, he's been a starting quarterback in this league since 2012. So the yes. sample size is larger. So what I wanted to do was break it down ratio wise to to try to make it seem more understandable to just a person who wants to know apples to apples. You're a casual fan. And, yeah. Right, exactly. So how I looked at it is I tried to break it down ratio wise. And what I found is that out of the 22 starts that Tyrod Taylor's had, he has brought back his team with his arm 
only once. And that was in the Houston Texans game last year. The other game was basically all on his legs. Right. Um, but I'm not going to take it away from him. He was still able to bring the team back. So I, I'm, I'm not going to like take that away. So what right. we call is two fourth quarter or later comebacks in 22 starts or one in every 11. When you look at the other side, when you look at the other side, Russell Wilson, two out of every seven games, he's bringing his team back in the fourth quarter or later. Um, that to me, I mean, that has to be the most telling stat of them all. Um, I mean, he's 20 times out of 71, basically. So when you, when you reduce that down, obviously, but it, it's, it's not that it's alarming, but it starts to beg the question of, you know, I, I think he's Russell Wilson. I think is probably what everybody wants to compare Taylor to. He's short, he's athletic, right? great deep ball, but Wilson does the small things. Wilson makes sure he leads receivers. He throws people open. And to this point, we just haven't seen that part of, uh, of Taylor's game. No, definitely. And, and, you know, they, they are very similar in many ways and you nailed it. You know, it's the diagnosis of defenses and of course, Russ Wilson's further along in his career. So there's that glamour and there is that hope. And I kind of touched upon it in, in, in the last video cast I did. And I looked at, you know, Russell Wilson's um, snap to attempt because right now Tyrod Taylor is number one in the league from snap to attempt and at three seconds flat. So I looked at Russell Wilson first year and see how he progressed and, he was at 2.97 leading the league when he was in 2012, his rookie season. So, uh, I mean, there are comparables and there is that, that glimmer of, Hey, you know what? He can still develop whether it's in Buffalo or not. I mean, I, I think, I think you're right. I think in the end, at the end of the season, I think they're going to have to keep him regardless. Yeah. Because there's just not a lot of other options unless you feel comfortable moving forward with a guy like Tony Romo, or if you feel comfortable, you know, Maybe you draft a guy for once, you know, right. who would have thought that maybe you draft a guy um, and he ultimately ends up being your answer. But again, how many Dak Prescott's do you really get? You know, they don't come around that often. So. No, totally. And so I'm going to bring up some film here. Just going to show some of the things that, you know, Tyrod does bring to this offense. And, you know, it is nice to have, especially when, you know, you have a stagnant offense who um, that does struggle at times. Um, let me move this around over here. I mean, obviously, he brings a lot in the run game. You know, he right. against Arizona, they ran a little you know option here, and he's fast. I mean, he's what runs right. a four four. I mean, he he does help the run game. I don't think the Bills used him enough this year in the run game. You know, when you're trying to evaluate a quarterback, why not accentuate what he does best, and that's run the ball. You know, right. And especially, I, I think what they're trying to do too is they realize how shorthanded they are and how much more shorthanded they'd be if Tyrod went out. Right. So I guess that that. I guess sediment plays through as well, but yeah, you're right. I mean, he does offer, you know, a lot in the run game and he has running back like abilities. That was a, just a sick move that he put on high tower here. Yeah. I mean, honestly, should he, should he even kept that there? I mean, unless it was it actually like no. a read, I, I thought he was, should have gave that right. <laughs> I absolutely should have gave it, but also, yeah, I mean, look at, look at shady. He's running basically wide open on the play, but right. again, his, his, his instincts come through and, and, you know, do well for him, but yeah. And his athleticism, again, it'll overcome a lot. And I mean, should have been a holding call in this play, but man, the teams, when they, when he spreads the defense out and teams want to play man coverage, he could take he it. To the house on every play. Yeah. It's where he's his most dangerous for sure. Why not? Why not do that more? I thought we should have did that more against the Patriots. They, they brought it out more in the second half um, and, and actually right out of the half and then I'm driving down and scoring. But um, I mean, he's, he's an athlete and, more times than not, and we'll show even on good and bad plays, it'll work in his favor. And but a lot of times, it also, you know, it'll hinder the offense. Yeah, no, absolutely. And that, I mean, that's that's what he gives you that other guys just can't. And that's his ability to escape pressure when it's basically coming down on you. Um, and, and of course, he's able to then extend the play, and then guys are able to get open. And man to man coverage, they can only play man to man so long. And once scramble rules come into effect, that's when you're going to see guys get open. And that's when he really takes advantage of well. Right. And, and he, part of the reason why he has such high snap to attempt numbers are because of plays, you know, right. standing back there and extend and whatnot. So you got to take that into account. And of course we're not just numbers guys. So we watch a lot of film, but mm -hmm. he's, he's pretty accurate on the run too. That's one of his strengths. Wouldn't you agree? Yeah, absolutely. And, and that's kind of what I've been more confused about why they haven't really moved the pocket, especially with, I, I don't want to see the offensive line struggle. They just haven't played, I think as well as it did last year. And so you'd think, Hey, move the pocket. If this guy is, successful doing it why don't we do it more and oh it is what it is because ultimately in the in this league you do have to be successful from the pocket so right. as much as you do want to move it you do have to realize hey teams 
aren't going to just let you roll up and right. They're eventually going to try to set the edge. Um, and, and those are things you have to be, you have to at least pay attention to. Right. And he does a great job on this play to Salas of, you know, breaking the pocket, getting outside and reacquiring his target um, downfield and just, you know, delivers a perfect pass. And, and honestly, this game was probably in my opinion, he had, you know, a couple big bombs, but right. this was probably his worst game um, so yeah. far this year. So, I mean, but he did have, again, those big plays and that's, that's kind of the way the defense or the offense was last year. It was kind of boom or bust. And so it was kind of alarming to see that the first, you know, two da- two games where, you know, if, if that deep ball wasn't there, he couldn't operate the offense. Yeah, no. And again, that's the thing is, is as important as the deep ball or deep ball or the big play is, I think to me, like, I, I think I've said this, you know, just watching the game is, you know, I would take back one of those big plays if it meant 10 successful short to intermediate pass plays because they do more they take up more time um and ultimately it makes the defense respect what you have to bring right and uh i'm gonna go on move on and with the film and we're gonna start looking at some uh some of the plays um not just you know with his legs but plays that he executed you know quite well within the offense and um let's see here all right are you able to see that nate yeah, I got it. All right, perfect. All right. So this is against uh, San Francisco, and, you know, it, it was a three-by-one set to uh, – the, the trip set is uh, actually to the field, and it's the touchdown to Hunter. And he just does a great job here, you know, off the snap, first of all, because San Francisco lined up late. And, I mean, it's it's obvious man coverage, right? Single high safety, yeah. man across yeah. the board. Um you know, they had Clay at the bottom of the screen matchup with the linebacker. They had Eric Reed trying to match up with Justin Hunter. So it was pretty obvious that it was mm-hmm. man coverage. So it was not much reading going on, right? Right. No, not at all. And what you'll see, too, is something here. The pump fake makes Taylor reestablish his base. So maybe right from the start, he, see, if you look at his hips right there, they are square to the line of scrimmage. Yep. Now, if he's forced to make a throw right there, he's not in position to make an accurate throw. But – that pump fake makes him reestablish his, his base. And it really, he, it, it uses, then he there, you see, he's able to use his hips and torque to make a really nice play. And this will be a better angle for it too. Right. Um, I think the pump fake is highly underutilized in this offense. And it really forces a quarterback to reestablish and really reestablish his, but the pocket as well. Um, right. And it's great. And it's great to manipulate, especially defensive, like on the safety side, it's a great way to manipulate coverage. So if you want to go left, you pump fake right and then come back to your left. Those are the types of manipulation um, that you just haven't really seen from this offense. No, you're right. And and the safety actually did jump on that play on that pump fake. And and we do need to use that more. You're absolutely correct, man. And this play is a perfect example of him coming out from under center with great fundamentals. One, two, three. I believe it's a five step. Yep. And where are his eyes right here, Nate? His eyes are in the middle of the field. And that's why O'Leary is open as the, as the guy that's going to be covering O'Leary has no idea because if you're a smart defender in this league right now, you're keying on Tyrod's eyes and you see he, he knows that he's open on this play and he waits till the last second. He manipulates the safety, keeps the middle linebacker on, on Bay two here. And it's one of those things where you want to see more of this because he makes the throw. I mean, it isn't fundamentally, it's not great because he's kind of, he's kind of just going off to the side, but it's one of those things where, his legs are closed. His hips are closed. He's forced to use his lower body. And when you keep it open and we'll see it, we'll see it on plenty of the bad of Tyrod because it's what makes him inconsistent. But on this play, his fundamentals out of, out of under center to me are just better. Right. And, and I, I picked this play as a, as a good play and gave him credit for this mainly because of his eyes. And it's something that when you watch these all 22 angles and tight camera angles, that's the first thing you look for in a quarterback where his eyes after he takes a snap and you're right. He keeps that safety at bay. And he also, you know, peeks to Clay on the double move down the seam, which mm-hmm. pulls that defender with Clay. Because yes, and that's know. what ultimately opened up that right, right. That right. gives him the extra. That gives him the extra ten yards for after the catch. And this play, honestly, was one of my favorite this year, um, just because the he threw it on the run to the bottom of the screen to Robert Woods. A little double move rolls out to his right, and I mean, how do you? How would you say his mechanics were? We'll see it from the tight camera angle, but his mechanics from the pocket, from, you know, scrambling right, mm-hmm. and how he reestablishes himself. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I remember specifically breaking this play down, and it's one of those where he had great time. He didn't have to throw this on the run, really. It was just an extended pocket. He right. reestablishes himself here, and if you look, he takes two two shuffle steps forward. That, to me, is the reason he was able to complete this ball but throw it so accurately is his hips were downfield. He uses his lower body there, and that's what's able to get put it able to allow him to put the zip on the ball, but do it accurately. If he's doing that on the run, he's probably not making that as accurate. You're and, right. and to me, this is what makes, to me, this is what makes him so, so dangerous is if he can just extend the pocket opposed to, you know, throwing on the run, this is really just an extension of the pocket and it buys him some extra time to really diagnose what's going on on the other side. Right. And, and it was one-on-one coverage. So not much reading. I mean, it was, right. I, I would consider that, you know, half roll to a roll to his right, but mm-hmm. you know, that he, you know, he, he gathers himself, points his shoulder downfield and he takes those two steps forward. And that's right. where the velocity comes from, where he can step into the throw. And he did mm-hmm. it. He timed it perfectly because he gets it right up over the top of possibly Hightower right in his face. So it was right. a good throw. One of my favorites this year by Tyrod. And it was, that was on the run, which is something he does quite well. Um, huh? Again, Agreed. most of his good throws, Nate. I mean, I from what I've seen on film, most of it's versus man coverage. So there's not, you know, many reads going on as far as reading, you know, zone defense, what type of defense we're in. And this is another one of those plays. But again, it's it's a good play. Um, versus, you know, man coverage. And you'll see it. It's just a great timing route. Let me move this out of the way. It actually anticipates a throw to Goodwin here. Yeah. On the screen, you know, it's it was really pretty because Goodwin wasn't even out of his break yet. Right. And those are the balls you don't see him throw enough, are the ones that he – see, like, he's already in the motion of throwing the ball. Right. The ball is released – right at the top of his route, which it's essentially un, you can't cover that play right. um, as a defense, especially in man to man, you can't cover that. And I, I don't know that he was in man here. This one looks a little to me, like it might be man front and then a little bit of zone backside um, just because of how he's playing it. And, and he never actually turns to run here. Right. So, but again, and, and what you want to see is like, if you see up top here, those guys are getting jammed, not exactly at the line of scrimmage, but at about the five yard mark. Right. Um, you don't get that. You don't get that on the bottom side. And I think Taylor, probably diagnose that pre-snap to say, okay, well, if I'm running a comeback route here, if the ball is released at the top of his route, he can't cover it as long as it's right. running accurately. Definitely. Um, so here's another play. Uh, I, I mean, that's the one main difference I've noticed since week two was that, you know, Tyrod pre-snap, he does have more freedom. Everyone's talked about that. Lynn's giving him more mm-hmm. freedom. And more freedom, in my opinion, is, you know, setting setting the the blocking, which it seems like he does here on the deep uh, pass to, to good. Which if you remember too, if, if you watch that, the, the pre-draft video that, that ESPN did, the, the big thing about Taylor was that he, even Michael Vick didn't do this when he was at Virginia Tech because he called all of the lines for the defensive uh, or for the offensive lineman at the, at the line of scrimmage, which is impressive for, I mean, even the professional level, only the top, you know, 10, 15 quarterbacks in the league that are comfortable with their offense are calling those all co- like they're calling the calls for the line of scrimmage at the right. line. And for him to be able to do that now, I think is really showing him. And if you're looking, he's just diagnosing that 40 front and it gives him, I think, and this offensive line some more time. And those are the things you want to see from your quarterback, especially pre-snap. Right. And, and it does, he, you know, he set the protection and he obviously uh, has Gillisley to help him here and he does kind of get wa- He wavers a little bit, but you know what? He, he mm-hmm. reigns calm, requires his, uh, you know, receiver downfield. And steps into the throw, and obviously he put it right on point. Uh, it was a good throw and, you know, a good play by Taylor pre-snap, you know, setting that protection mm-hmm. and, and, and reading that defense. So I, I know you, you love this play from him. I do. And, yeah, it's one of those where – yeah, it, it's one of those where the zone – is one of the is one of the more difficult plays. This is this is going to be a really good angle of it, but the zone is one of the more difficult defenses. A quarterback basically has to manipulate out of you know out of the pocket, and you'll see on this play, he's essentially double covered. It's a window throw, right. and it is so accurately thrown that you can't defend it. And right. you have a guy on the outside, on the inside. He diagnoses now. I don't know if this is on purpose or if it just happened to be where it was thrown, but it's when you look. It is. It's a great location because he's draping his back and you throw it away from the defender. It gives your, 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 you know, your receiver on the play, a great opportunity to make a play for you. And I don't think he does it enough. I don't think he allows his guys to make plays for him enough, but this is, like you said, it's one of my favorite plays. Right. And, and what I loved about this is 
he does see, even though his eyes are downfield, he sees this little game being played by the defensive lineman. And you know what? He trusts his blockers he, by sliding to his right just a little bit to give him yep. that, that throwing window. And like you said, I mean, perfect location. I mean, whether it was planned or not, it looked to me, I'll give him credit. I think he, he planned to throw it there. He knew yeah. that Joyner had inside leverage there. So, I mean, that was a good good play by Tyrod on that. And, you know, the next two clips are probably, again, some of my favorite throws just because, you know, what kind of defense are they in here, Nick? Can you explain what kind of defense are in here? Let's see here. Is there – uh, that's a referee, right? Okay, that's a referee. It looks like we're in a pretty classic – well, it looks like it – see, what it looks like it might be is quarter, quarter, half, because what you have is he's going to send him outside, so that's a cover two up top, and it looks like he's bailing, so it looks like a cover four at the bottom and a cover two up top here. Right, yeah, it does. It has. It's a cover two shell. To me, what what's telling is this inside Tampa, linebacker. Tampa. Tampa, Tampa, so it does look yeah. at Tampa too, but you know what? Tyrod knew it. I mean, whether we know yeah. it or not, Tyrod knew it, and that's what's well, yeah, needs to happen. Um, but, I mean, these these are the types of things you're going to see in the pros compared to other levels. You know what I mean? You're going to exactly. see more complex um, coverages. And on this play, to me, what I think gives it away is it might be a quarter, quarter, half, or, you know, a half, two, half, four right. is basically based on this bottom side corner. This bottom side corner, look where he is. Right. Is he's essentially you have what looks to be press up top and then you have this guy essentially five yards off. Mm-hmm. He bails on a cover two in a traditional cover two. You never have a bailing guy. He's jamming, 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 jamming. And then if he comes in, you're sending it to the linebackers. And that's exactly what the top guy does. He jams him at the line, sends him into the linebackers and re kind of reestablishes himself. But he's already right. out of position. So it's a great throw. And it's really what you would call a cover two buster, um, a play that really if run well, and it's just your smat, your obvious smash concept, smash concept if, yeah. if run well is undefendable against the cover two look. And even in the crazy part about it, why I think it's even more impressive that it was run so well is the safety is playing up on that side of the line of scrimmage. So he's really has the advantage here. It's such a small window, but a terrific throw from Taylor nonetheless. No, definitely. And, and we'll see it from the tight camera angle. That was a 17 yard gain. And I think Nick O'Leary, but he does a good job from the pocket too. He's very, his feet, you know, at times can be, you know, out of out of control let's let's be mm-hmm. honest here but he does a good job of keeping his base let me see if i can get this yep. out of the way. um he does a good job of keeping his base um at the top of his drop and i mean he is looking it looks like he's he's eyeing that that safety that deep half uh safety there so he's holding him as best he can and just delivers an accurate pass it was i mean it was a little high but i, I can understand why maybe he he placed it a little high and a heck of a catch by you know, nickel yeah. with no gloves, but he had the to put it over that like corner, right? Yeah, and the thing you like to see, though, is he's on his toes. Right. And there are so many examples of some of his bad throws where he's flat-footed. He's standing still, and that's when he has some of his worst throws. But here, on his toes, he's bouncing, he's moving, and David Lee bragged about it in the offices. I have tons of sound from it of him saying that they watched tons of Peyton Manning film. And that right there, right. that indicates that you have been watching Peyton Manning film because that is a classic Peyton Manning move. Sits in the pocket tall, on his toes bouncing and that what that bounce does is it really keeps you balanced and it keeps you I, so if if a throw opens up quickly you're in position automatically if you're flat-footed there's going to be a, you know something that opens it up quickly you're not able to make that throw because you're not in position to do so when you're on your toes like that you can make any throw at any time right you're right you know keep that base because i mean for a quarterback your footwork is number one as when it comes to fundamentals when it comes to training when it comes to everything right. everything is is based upon your footwork and on that play he nailed it and this one yeah. is just another it's one of those throws that he, he actually reads his own coverage it's a trips uh, bunch set uh you know the ball's right in the middle of the field it's trips bunch set to the top of the screen and of course a isolation right on the bottom but mm-hmm. Tyrod Taylor does a good job. You know, he gets to the top of his drop and the ball's coming out. So I think this, this might've been the second play of the game or first drive at the very least. And, and he just know he knows the defense and he gets yeah. rid of it. And, and it's a timing route. I mean, if you see, you see here, this guy, uh, the inside linebacker has to carry. Bales. Yeah, he has to, he has to carry up the seam just a little bit. And there's a small window where that linebacker is, you know, letting that uh, receiver clear and the cornerbacks off way too far to get to this little hitch. Uh, in the hook to curl area at the numbers, and Tyra nailed it. Absolutely, no, you're you're completely right, and and those are the types of things that you want to see more of. But again, it, it's one of those things where again, out of out of center. Yeah, it's your basic. It's it's not a great five step, but it it gets the job done. You'd like to see him get more depth on it, I think. Right, but 
But at the same time, I think if he does get more depth, he's probably he doesn't have the rush in his face. But again, it, this is just kind of you know splitting hair. Right. <laughs> and the other thing, it could have been a game plan thing too, based on the you know being backed up and having Chandler right. Jones against Cyrus Quanjo. It could be any number yeah. of things, but all in all, it was it was a good read. I mean, that's the thing to me on this play. It's he knew what the defense was gonna give him and show him, and he Right. Got rid of the ball on time, and to me, that's that's why I gave him credit for this. This is a good throw early in the game against Arizona. Yeah, that was a great throw. All right, again, so, and those are just those timing routes against against zone coverage, against zone timing is critical, or else they'll pick you off. It's just the way it goes in in a zone. Right. So, I know you're one of the most hated guys, it seems, on Twitter and social media when it comes to Tyrod Taylor, because you know, and and I I kind of get flack for it too, and I'm sure Jeremy White does. Um, because we, I mean, we're going to call out things we see on film, you know, and mm-hmm. Hey, we, we don't, you get paid to do it. I mean, I do it for fun, but it's, it's stuff that is going on in the meeting rooms, you know, mm-hmm. every time it has, you know, to be. It has, it has to be, that's how you learn. That's how you progress. So I don't understand why people, you know, give, you know, give us flack for that because that's, what's going on in, in the meeting rooms, you know? So yeah, absolutely. Let, me, let me bring up some of this film and it's going to start off with, um, the Jets game, like I said, which to me was one of his worst games this year. All right, you able to see that, Nate? Yep, I got it. All right, so the the thing that we've been dealing with Tyrod, it's, you know, he's been a half field read kind of guy. He's A lot of his reads are predetermined, right, in the first, you know, you know two years of his starting a, a, um, playing time. Um, and – you know, a lot of people are like, you know, that's on the offense coordinator. Okay, I, I get that. But there's a reason that this offensive coordinator is calling these kind of plays, right? Right. Exactly. And it's and it's disguising. And, and instead of disguising a defense, you're disguising and you're, you're covering up for your quarterback instead. And, again, these are things. And now, you have to remember, this is, this is a Greg Roman here. So you've only right. got three options. That's difficult for a quarterback. You basically have to find your matchup because with only three guys out there against it's what one, two, three. It's it's a man to man, so right. that's difficult. It's it's a man to man with the one eye, so it's a cover one, and yep. that's going to be difficult to hit a deep route on. But what you see here is maybe what you'd like to do is wait a little longer because you do end up having Charles Clay come open. I think that's who that is. Yes, um, on the play, come open. No, maybe not. Clay stayed in, so I'm not I'm not exactly sure who that might be. But so it's somebody, I believe it's good when coming across the middle. Really, really from the start, he's open. And again, right. you want to see if you're if you're a quarterback and you diagnose that it's man to man, you're hitting the crossing route. Yeah. And that's why, you know, I mean, to me, this was an obvious predetermined read. Would you agree with that? Oh yeah. No, no doubt. And yeah. I mean, cause I mean, really, does he look off? No, no, he's not looking right at this, uh, you know, single high safety yep. and he's just holding. It's not doing anything. No, nope. it's not doing anything because he's already in position to make that play. Right. And, and, and we see these still under Anthony Lynn. There's no doubt about that. And, you know, here's, here's one to me from the Patriots game. Um, it's the bottom of the screen. He's trying to get the ball to go and I guess, against uh, Malcolm Butler, which they did target Butler a lot um, in this game. But you'll see it's it's pretty good coverage. He's looking right at him off of the snap. You know, if, yeah. if only he would have came off, you'll see this. Clay's coming right across the middle. Again, it's the crossing route. And then right. you, you have a cover one here again. And you just want to see him recognize that and know what to do in that situation. And it's, right. you just don't see it here. And, it, and it's obvious he's looking right at that matchup. Of course, mm-hmm. you know, Lynn T is telling him find the matchup, but I, I don't think that's a matchup in our favor. You know, Marquise Goodwin versus Malcolm Butler. This throw right here should be made right now. And especially because he doesn't have a super clean pocket. Mm-hmm. This is one of the ones where you have to say, okay, I'm under siege. What's my easiest throw right now? My easiest throw is that crossing route, which is right. wide open. Yeah. That's disappointing, especially once you get it into is. that, you know, inside the 30 or 20 or whatnot. And especially if you're, if you're trying to find a matchup, is he not diagnosing the matchup then? Is he just being told, okay, go Sammy or go here? Because if you're diagnosing that matchup there, if, you're, if you know that you're getting a rush, what's your hot read? It's your closest receiver. Your hot read is your closest receiver or the one who has the defender furthest off from him. And in that situation, Charles Clay's right there at the line of scrimmage. You need to know, look, at he's even playing outside leverage. Right. He, he gave it in. He gave it to him, and um, unless unless Tyrod thought that High Tower was going to drop back instead of instead of uh, blitz on that play, right, right. But I, to me, there's no excuse that this is to me. If, I, if I'm looking at it from this angle right now, mm-hmm. no doubt I'm not going Charles Clay with the outside leverage and everything tells you on this play Charles Clay is going to be open, 
And, and prior to this, prior to this matchup, Nate, too. I mean, you look at how often Patrick Chung has been abusing coverage. This, to yeah. me, what going into this week, I remember this. That's was, the matchup. That's the yeah. matchup. <laughs> yeah, so it was disappointing to see that, especially because I, I mean, as good as Goodwin is down the field, I mean, I'll take Clay versus Chung all day. And oh, yeah. touched upon how you know his inaccuracies um, have definitely hindered him as a passer and hindered this offense. And and I gave you the numbers before, and there they are again. And that's his accuracy of seventy point seven percent is actually twenty third out of twenty nine quarterbacks that mm-hmm. of quarterbacks that have taken fifty percent of the snaps. But um, we're going to get into now on why those inaccuracies are you know are, are are present every every single week. I mean, it's something that I I hope we can, he can get better at. But uh, you know, it scares me honestly, Nate. Yeah, and especially on this play, again, like you, what you want to see more of, oh, and that, and that's the play. And, yeah. <laughs> and what it is, just, it's frustrating to see too because on a similar play to this, you have guys who are just wide open. Now, right. this isn't wide open. This is a play that should be thrown on a two trajectory. Which, if you're not familiar, there's three trajectories a quarterback throws with. One, which is your bullet. Two, which is uh, basically anything thrown over the middle because you have to realize you have to throw over a linebacker or right. over a safety. And then three is your deep ball or deep post trajectory, which is going to be a high arcing coming down, going into a basket. And right. this needs to be thrown on a two and it needs to be thrown ahead of his receiver. You'll see two, which I can show with my mouse right here. I don't know if you can see what I'm doing here. This is the area it needs to be thrown in. And I know he, you probably want to protect your guy because you see this guy right here, the safety. But at the same time, you just need, you need to be able to hit this on money. Every, you had to be, an NFL quarterback has hit this eight times out of 10 right. and it's high and this ball can't be high if it, it needs to lead him open. And and, it's, it's, and you'll see it from the broadcast angle. It's, it's not just high. It's completely it's back. It's yeah, terrible. It's I mean, even the tallest receiver is probably not going to bring that in. I mean, look at that. That's, no. No. that's inexcusable in my opinion. Right. And look at all that open space in the middle of the field. Right. It's, it's inexcusable. Right. Okay. So we'll, we'll move on to the next play. That was one of the worst. Worst throws I've seen him make, especially on that deep dig. I know that that irritated you. <laughs> it is, and it, it's a terrible play action fake too. And, and this goes back to you know you right. have to at least put the ball in the stomach, or else the defense isn't going to give you any sort of respect on a play action right. that they're not going to like. Look, he he pulls it before he even gets there, and those linebackers take one step and they know immediately it's a pass. Boom, they're bailing now. You and know I know, what I'm saying? yeah, I, we've talked about that off air of you yeah. know having him in shotgun. It's plain as day that shotgun you're not going to get a, uh, the same action from your right. linebackers on play action right. they're just not going to bite on it because most of the time unless you're in the pistol most of the time the fakes are are, are horizontal so yeah, poor. yeah it's right. poor you can it, the, the ball is is basically vulnerable the ball is out there they can see it and it's easier to diagnose yeah definitely so all right let's move on to another one here another inaccurate pass um and and kind of give me an idea on what he does wrong here from a footwork perspective sure. nate yeah let's see are you able to control it? Go ahead if you need to. Oh, no, no, we're good. You got it. All right. Uh, let's see. Right. Oh, man. Oh, there it is right there. Yep. If you want to back it up right to here, you see right now where the hips of Tyrod Taylor, where he's pointing mm-hmm. is essentially to the sidelines. All right. Now, I understand the route is going to the sidelines, but what you want to see is him cockeyed. You want to see his shoulder, his front shoulder is going to be his aim shoulder. That's where the ball is going to go. So where is he? Where is his front shoulder? It's at the sidelines. So where's the ball going to go? Right. Down into the side. And I, I, this is a difficult play, but what you want to see him do is shuffle. You want to see him stay square but shuffle back instead of almost running to the side here and again that's pocket manipulation that comes with time doing it but you know his pocket presence is is below average and on this play what he needs to realize is that ball needs to be thrown to the inside to let him stop and where, where you want this ball to be thrown is really right here you want that ball to be thrown right in that spot right. so that he's able to then come back up field. And that's just one of the things that, again, and it comes with time. So it's something that I still think he can develop. Mm-hmm. Um, but again, it, it was disappointing on that play for sure. Right. And of course, I think that was a third and long or whatnot. But it's, mm-hmm. these are these are things that have come up, you know, week in and week right. out. And here's another one. I know this is kind of going back to the Jets game. But again, it was one of his worst, worst games. And, and and I magnified it there so you could see it. I mean, you it, the ball is thrown to the, to the sideline. And you here. want to know why? Because that's why. And, and again, it's it's mechanics. And 
a quarterback is is only as good as it's is his lower body. Now, right. some of the best quarterbacks in the league, Ryan Mallett, he has got maybe the best natural arm in the league, but his fundamentals are piss poor, and he he doesn't use his lower body, and that's the most most important key for a quarterback is his lower body. Definitely, and and it was just a, a quick out route by Goodwin, and you know it, it's an easy play to make. NFL quarterbacks should make this, but. You're right. His, you know, his shoulders, his footwork was just mm-hmm. they're pointed in the wrong, in the wrong, on the wrong angle, basically. And you know, the throw, it's reflected in that poor throw. And this happens week in and week out again. Um, and here's a play where his, not his lead foot, but his trail foot um, actually cost yes. him a completion here. It's, it's a deep, ugly too. It's... Yeah, it's a deep out, uh, deep hook route to uh, Hunter to the bottom of the screen. And you know, he's got the right idea. It's not a bad decision. Right. Right. But this is one of those things too. Like, and I think maybe whoever that underneath receiver was didn't write. One of them didn't run the correct route because it was really spacing was terrible. Right. Um, and maybe it was Felton on the play. Actually, it looks like he went out for a route there. But so yeah, no. Again, <laughs> right. Spacing's big, and on this play, you'll see. This is the best angle you'll see about it is his his uh, his drag foot. So yeah, I mean, usually, right, Nate? Usually, you want that trail foot following through, right? Correct. And he almost holds it back. And that's what makes it, that's what ultimately leads to that throw being behind. Right. Um, and those are just little mechanics. They're little things, but they're things that end up costing you big in a game like this. Absolutely. I mean, normally if your trail, if you don't follow through correctly with your trail foot, what's going to happen? The ball will sail, right? Hi. Yep. Right. And that's what happens here. And that's I mean, happens. as a commentator said, you know, this was a, a big receiver, Justin Hunter, and you know, could he have caught that? Yeah, but I mean, again, that's tough. That's that is right. asking a lot of people. Right, I definitely. Mean, I mean, he's fully he's fully stretched out on that. <laughs> right. No, I agree, man. And and these are the kind of plays that Tyrod he does have to get better at. And and that's the thing with him. You know, he's so gifted athletically that yeah, that you, you know he he always resorts to that. And he's not under pressure on this play, so I, I won't no. use that as an excuse here, but. He, he gets sloppy with his mechanics because he, you know, more times than not, he can make plays. Right. No, absolutely. And sometimes he almost resorts back to him. As we mentioned, it's almost the Tim Tebow effect. Yeah, you know, definitely. It's when, you're, when you're under pressure, you, you forget about the things you've been trying to learn and you go back to things that are natural to you. So Right. And, and this play against the Rams, it, it, he is under pressure. And, he, and I'll give him credit here at the line of scrimmage. What does he do? He changes the play. Mm-hmm. He's the coverage that he wants up here, Robert Woods. Um, versus the cornerback there. So he does a good job in that department. He, he put the Bills in the right play. But, Two, four, six, eight, 10, 11. So you've got no deep safety on the play. Right, right. And so he's got a no pressures coming. Yeah. And he, he, you can see from his footwork when we get to the tight camera angle, this is the incompletion it's, to it's Robert. Ugly. Yeah, it's and ugly. It's, it's bad. It's really bad because this is a touchdown. And it's only a yard or two difference. I mean – so but you know what? You know, you, know where, you know where the yard comes from too is when you see him bail here. He bails. He backpedals. He bails out of a natural pocket. If you look right. right here is where he wants to make this throw. He should step up in this pocket, not yes. bail out. And then what you do is he by shifting left, he comes into this basically pocket of pass rush right here. But right. the natural pocket that is created for him is right here. Right. It's right here in this spot, and it's there. If he steps up in that pocket, he's able to make a way more accurate throw. And instead, he backs out, he steps into the rush, right. and he's, he basically short arm it, which I think ends up leading to the inaccurate throw because this is his throw all day. I mean, this is what his, this is his bread and yeah. butter. But he panics. He absolutely panics, and he throws it, if you watch his hips too on this play, where he ultimately ends up throwing, where is he aimed? Yeah. He's right. aimed right there. He's aimed out of bounds. He uses none of his lower body. It's all arm. And when you all use arm. all arm on that, and when you use all arm on that play, you're not going to throw it accurately. This is one of his his worst uh, plays from beginning to end, as far as mechanics goes and footwork. Because you're right, man. You can tell once he hits the top of his drop, right there. He takes a, two extra steps, two little shuffles. They're very subtle. Right, right back. Yeah, yeah. You know, and and that he, you're right. He should have stepped up. You know, got gathered himself. And delivered that throw, even if Robert Woods isn't looking for the ball yet, throw it to a spot where the mm-hmm. receiver can run up under it. And he didn't. And exactly. that's a big play. I mean, that, that could have been a, a big play for play. Robert Woods. Yeah. That's a huge play. Now, obviously, they end up winning the game, but still, that could have been a huge play. Yeah. And, and, and it happens, you know, time and time again. I think, it, was this the play you were speaking of uh, when we were talking uh, before we went live? This was, uh, there was a deep, there was a uh, dig by Powell, similar to the play we showed earlier. 
And is there another view of this or no? No, I think this is the only view I, I, I recorded. Yeah. But there was a deep dig on the outside to Powell. And, and you know, if you look to Charles Clay's open. Right. Exactly. And to me, his he resorts to his athleticism and oh this is an easy throw you would think for a quarterback but because he, he he's off but he's, his footwork is still not good there i mean right he's throwing across his body that? yeah and what you want to see him do is then he's got a clean pocket you want to see him pivot you want to see him turn completely and give this throw 100 percent effort and you're right. right about the laziness this is this is what ultimately comes down to is laziness and Maybe if he doesn't have to go to the ground for this, maybe he's able to turn around and gain four or five, at least five yards. Yeah. And instead he's, you know, stuck making a, doing whatever he can to get as much yard as he can on the play. And I, honestly, man, it's a three man rush. You look at it, it's a three man rush. Right. He, if you, you said, if he manip- you know, manipulates that pocket, mm-hmm. he has, he still has time. Right. You know, he doesn't have to leave Absolutely. the pocket to extend a play. You can stay in the pocket and still, you know, make plays from the pocket, which he doesn't like to do. And, and again, I think that's because he, he resorts to his athleticism and ability to yeah, get outside totally. the pocket. That's what it is with this. And his eyes, I mean, this was from, you know, he had Watkins then, but his mm-hmm. eyes, you know, from time to time, he, he stares guys down and he got away with it on this play because I, I believe it was a uh, one-on-one coverage outside. It was Sammy Watkins versus Jimmy Smith. But yeah. from the get go, his eyes are right you on. Are. Yeah. And, yeah. and, we, again, that play action barely moved these guys, allows them to drop into their landmarks. And, right. you know, although it was a completion, even on good plays. So Lynn's right. You know, the stats don't always reflect, you know, what's going on on the good or bad. Good or bad. Good or bad. Yeah. And this is one of it those is. plays. He's getting credit for this, but this was actually from a, a, a you know, player standpoint, from a critique standpoint, wasn't that good. Yeah, and as Coach McAdoo said, stats are for nerds anyways. <laughs> yeah, right? <laughs> so here's another one where he um, is versus the Cardinals, and he underthrows a receiver. Uh, it's Marquise Goodwin to the bottom of the screen. Um, he does – Taylor does look to the boundary front side uh, for the pass. And I give him credit. He does a good job. A little pump fake. You know, utilize that pump fake and comes back to Goodwin, and Goodwin's wide open. And Goodwin shouldn't have trailed this in, though. It's a little bit of Goodwin's fault, but at the same time – um, yeah, it's, it's one that you want to see him, what you want him to see here is, is if you rewind this back to really the start of the play, yep. you're going to see the guy that's sitting over the slot receiver. Okay. He comes, he comes on that blitz. So I think that's right. I think ultimately he was, yeah, right here to me is, is gotta be a hot read. Right. I, I would be getting Robert Woods, the ball at the line of the scrimmage. Right. And then, and then you're taking whatever he gets on the play because ultimately if he just screams outwards and I think teams are picking up on the fact that they're unwilling to do this type of play. And I mean, look at this, his, his the man that's supposed to be covering him, obviously you have the hook to curl on that middle right. linebacker. Yeah. But if you just run a, a swing or just, Hey, give me the ball to let of scrimmage, let him run. He's right. got nobody within eight yards, 10 yards of him. And then you have maybe, then you have Goodwin at least get in the way of Peterson. And then you don't know, but if you get the ball to him at, you know, in this spot right here, that hook to curl is eight yards at best. And he's not going to catch Robert Woods. Right. No, I agree. And you know, whether that is not built in the offense or not is we don't know that, but all we can go off is the film here, but yeah, it's a five man rush. I think this is clay to the top of the screen and you know, they roll the coverage to clay, which is fine. There's a little double move to clay, but that means, and Tyra should know this, that means that this inside linebacker here, right. he's got a lot to cover here. He's got the hook. So he's got a lot to cover, yeah. And, I mean, yeah. I think that's Dayon Buchanan. But, and can he do that? Yeah, but this should still yeah. be a completed pass, in my opinion, because – Absolutely. And, it's much- again, it's it's one of those things where it's one of the – it's it's frustrating, but at the same time, you you can, I guess you can kind of understand where he's come from because there's a lot to do on this play, but I, I'm not even – I'm not looking right. Look at the matchup. You yeah. have one versus three. Or two versus two, where are you going? Right. You're going to the two versus two minute. Yeah, and and the underthrow. I mean, it looks like he does take. Um, it's a pretty good pocket. He does get some pressure off here off the edge, but um, again, I like that he used the pump fake, like you mentioned before. That's a good pump fake. Get that you know front side safety scream in there. But um, in the end, he does have uh, wood you know blocking guy right in his face, so he can't really step into the throw. So I mean, I won't right. totally put that on him. 
But in the end, you're an NFL quarterback standing. It's, it'd be nice to have a guy that could stand in there and make that throw up over the top of, Absolutely. you know, the because defense. if you look, there is an area there to step up into as well. Right. So. Right. No, I know we're, we're, we're nitpicking here, but again, yeah. that's, what's, yeah. that's what's great about this. You know, it's that's, our that's job not on the line. <laughs> <laughs> that's so true. <laughs> So, all right, let's see here. Another one uh, when it comes down to pocket presence that um, I think this is one play. You may you may have broken this down, right, the, the play yeah. to Charles Clay here? Yeah. So uh, go ahead from the yeah. tight camera angle. This is one of your, one of your faves, I'm sure. Yeah, and, and what you end up seeing here is a wide-open receiver, ultimately. He ends up breaking open, and he gets past Kiko Alonso's face. Right. And you see, you see right here, you see it that – there is no need to throw this off balance. Yeah. What you want is you want to shift right. You just want one right. shuffle step right and right. one step up. And then you're able to make a, an accurate throw on this play. The thing you won't really see from this is how much open space Charles Clay had in front of him if he had just gotten this ball thrown ahead of him. Right, Instead, he has to go back for it. You see him, right? Okay, perfect. I mean, there's all this open. I mean, and look at these guys. Right, right. And it's meant to be a bail route. So you have those guys bailing, and then you have – all that open space it's yeah. it's it's tough it really is there's just nobody with it if he can catch that at the numbers he's running for 15 yards probably untouched right he's having another big day versus versus his former team but you know it, yeah. it, it's it is you know these are little things you know look in the pocket I mean there's not a bad pocket yeah you got some edge pressure here but they can blow right by and, and Cordy Cordy Glenn does a good job of just letting them blow right by you just you know it would have been nice I mean he completed I get it but again the stats don't always tell the story and that's one of those plays and, and we were talking about hot reads earlier and whether they're built into this offense or not. But this is one of those blatant plays where I think the receiver actually bailed him out. He was he looked yeah. back immediately after that blitz, and he just didn't hit him. Instead, he tries Ugh. throwing it to the deep out, and that's an incomplete pass. I mean, it's ugly. Yeah. I mean, it's second and, you know, a, what, three yards, second and three and four. I mean, this is this is an easy play. It's a first down. Play, yeah. you know? It's a drive extender is what right. that is. Yeah, I was disappointed to see on that. And it's again, to watch, yeah. one of his uh, you know worst plays from this year, and and I think what happened here is Darren Lee was actually supposed to cover Clay, and for some reason he he he, I, he jams him, thinks he's got safety. Right, is what. Yeah. It, oh no, he doesn't even he doesn't even jam him. Yeah, no. he got totally. So I don't know if he was you know biting on the run fake or the weak. Yeah. You know, yeah. the back I, I think he cross. did bite on the run, but, but I don't know. That's bad. Yeah, yeah it's, it's bad, bad right and. Right. Tyrod should have, I mean, his eyes are in the right direction. His eyes are to that side, but it, it, maybe it was a predetermined read. Like we talked about earlier with Goodwin mm-hmm. on the outside because yeah. he was wide open on that. And that was, that was a play that, you know, we should, you should make 10 out of 10 times. And, and I talked about, you know, him possibly playing it safe for a contract. I mean, a play like this. Um, and, and actually, was this the play you were talking about? This is a swing route to Gillisley. Yes, this is the play. Okay, here it is. This is yeah. the play. And then you obviously see, I think this is Powell. Um, you see Powell wide open right. in that window. Even if if you have a veteran receiver, a veteran receiver sits in that instead of right. continuing continuing on. But the throw needs to be made right. And and this is one of those where I think it's a it's a created basically progression. Right. If you look, he goes one two and then comes back to Gillisley on this. Just there are so many so many better options on this play. Right. The option to me has to be this outside guy here at the bottom of the screen who opens up perfectly in that right. it is yet. Yeah, and, and it's got to be him every time. And what you have to realize, again, this is figuring out the coverage. Would you rather go three on two on the backside or ultimately what this turns into is a one on two on the front side. And right. again, it's, it's diagnosing matchups. And obviously, you know, then this outside linebacker here has to jam the, the um, tight end line of scrimmage. So right. He's really out of the picture. He doesn't jam. So that ultimately leaves him open a little bit. He bails immediately to that hook to curl. Right. And yeah, it is, it's, it's a pre-snap. I mean, it's, it's quite obvious they're in the two shot. <laughs> he's looking yeah. right at McCourty and I don't know why. I, I mean, maybe it's, he's told to do this, but you know, based on the coverage, he should, like you said, you should be looking to, to the three receiver side. Why he even looks yeah. that way. I, I don't know. I don't know if that's planned. Yeah. I don't know if he's told to do that. Yeah. But the obvious, the obvious throw here is, if, if, if his eyes were front side from the get-go, who knows? Maybe he does see this. Maybe he can anticipate it. We don't know that, but I, I agree. He did have an opportunity versus this cover to uh, Tampa 2 look yeah. to, to get it here, especially with uh, Landon Roberts. His, his back is his, his back, back is to that. Now, you know? back into it. 
No. So, I mean, if he right. does no anticipate way. that, that's that's a, a clear window, too. Clear window. Right. And obviously, that's that what, go, what goes down to that is that personnel. And what it is, it is personnel. And I, I'll say it's 50-50, the fault of, well, you know, I'm, I'm going to give more fault to the quarterback because he doesn't even look that direction. But right. what you'd want to see a veteran receiver do is settle down on the zone and let him make a good accurate throw. Right, you know, whether he sits or just even gears down a little bit to give his – or show his numbers. Like you said, just show his numbers and, and, and so that Tyrod could see him and get the ball in there. I mean, that's a, that's a tough throw, but a, a throw that he can make. Yeah, yeah absolutely. So we'll move on to the next play here. Um, this is, again, a play that actually turned out well where Tyrod threw it down the seam to his uh, number two receiver and it ends up being on the goal line, but – What's the problem with this play, Nate? You'll see here. It's let's find out. Let's see I mean, here. it's it's just straight cover two, Tampa two with Kiko deep middle. Yeah. I mean, as soon as this receiver clears the hook, the curl, that ball should be coming out. I mean, the ball should be uh, coming. Open, yeah. You know, as soon as he's right there, right so there. when he turns, the ball's in the hole. Instead, he holds it, and honestly, luckily, he didn't get his guy killed here at the goal line because it's a late, late throw doesn't anticipate it and and you know the safety could have really laid a lick on him yeah that too and you also have the you have that deep downside guy too right. who breaks the cover too as well but yeah the, right the, again we're nitpicking a little bit but you're right the timing of this route is, is is far off the ball should have been released right when he passed the face of um of that sinking linebacker for sure right and and here's the final play of this clip again anticipation it's something that when we watch russell wilson tomorrow night we know that He's, he's able to do these type of things, and, and we hope that Tyrod could develop this. Um, it does worry me because he's so athletic that he may resort to that and never fully progress to be the, the type of quarterback that Russell Wilson is. But um, we can hope that he begins making throws where he can anticipate. Or on this one, he doesn't. And he ends up – I believe he takes a sack here. But you'll see at the top of the screen, there's a, a, a deep, uh, in-breaking route. It's deep, but yeah. if, he, if he anticipates that throw – I mean, even he panics, he panics, what he does. He panics. and it's, he had the outside rush guys, but there was a cl- easy pocket there. Now, obviously they end up making the play on him late, but the ball should have been released. I don't know. Right. Uh, let's see. Right about now yeah. is when the ball, should, he should have been anticipating the fact that that, that corner was bailing clearly. Right. Um, he was, what he was worried about was beginning to be deep. And then when you come across, you already have an occupying guy in that slot. He's taking that safety. There's a wide open play to be had there. And if not, you also have Charles Clay here who ends up bailing after out, basically getting that initial block. He bails out. I mean, he's open at, at yeah, at the very least. Um, no, 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 I'm talking about the guy right at the line of scrimmage. So it'll be this oh, yeah, guy yeah. right here. Right. He yeah. ends up cut blocking and then getting up. Now, obviously, he's probably not even in the tender receiver. That might be a running back, actually. Yeah. Um, but at the very least, that should have been dump off to him and let him go do work. But, but no, I, I agree. That goes down to anticipation for sure. Yeah, and we'll see it from the tight camera angle real quick. Um, but, I mean, yeah, they had those edge rushers come in and whatnot. But all he had to do is, I mean, he hits the top of his drop. Fine. His eyes are downfield. His eyes are actually to the side of the field that we need him to be on this play mm-hmm. to make that throw. But, see, he pulls it down and he takes his eyes, obviously, you know, takes his eyes off of the receivers, and he's 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 running himself right into a sack, and honestly, yeah. almost runs into Eric Wood, and, and has to you know bounce it to his left, and he gets sacked. But there was an opportunity for a big play here with just you know half a second of anticipation, just get rid of the throw it to a point, let that receiver, even if that receiver's not looking, give him a chance to run under it, run to it, and make the play. You know, and that's just something we need to see more of from Tyrod because I mean, be honest, I mean, what percentage of passes this year? Have you seen from Tyrod that he actually threw someone open? Right. No, almost none. And none, and, right? And and the dig is one of those routes that you and the slant and those kind of plays you require your quarterback to throw you open because a lot of those are you're gonna have a guy trailing on your back. What you need is a guy to have you basically get the ball while you're running. And if that's not the case, then it's gonna be an ugly play. Right. No, you did a great job, Nate, man. I appreciate you coming Thanks, on. Man. Go ahead and give me, give, you know, plug your, your, your Twitter, Twitter handle and whatnot, you know, let, let the, let the fans know where they can find you. Cause you did a great job breaking down this film with me, man. Yeah. Um, I'm on Twitter at Nate, N-A-T-E, Geary, G-E-A-R-Y, W-G-R. So it's all, you know, under no underscores or anything like that. And, uh, yeah, I do a lot of Twitter. So yeah. And I, I do a bunch of breakdowns with Buffalo rumblings too. So you can catch me on there, but uh, yeah, we'll have to do this before, man. Nate, thanks for coming on, man. Enjoy your Sunday off, and uh, I'll, I'll be talking with you tomorrow pregame and whatnot. Are you actually on air tomorrow, or what are you doing tomorrow? 
Yes, I will be hosting the halftime show and then I'll also be hosting network post game. So hopefully it'll be a nice post game. So it'll be fun. <laughs> all right, man. Well, good job. And I'll be listening uh, tomorrow night. All right. Cool. Have a good day, bro. Yeah, appreciate it. All right. See ya.